Freaking trucks with cats. All right, so we're here at Court of the Patriarchs because hardly anybody stops at this stop. So it's kind of a great place to run. Up the hill here has an awesome view, but the real hike is actually across the river. And it's not a set hike, hardly anyone knows about it, but we're gonna go over there and see some cool scenery. So where are we at right now? This is... This is stop four, four. Court of the Patriarchs. Okay. Like I said, there's hardly anyone who stops here because they don't really know that there's actually something you can go to other than this tiny little trail. It says it's about three and a half miles, is that right? Well, three and a half miles up from the visitor center, but the trail is like a hundred yards. Oh. But the place we're gonna go is not an actual trail. It's past the stables, and it's kind of a cool place that nobody knows about. We're doing this earlier in the day because we're gonna catch a cooler overlook hike later in the day and hopefully catch the sunset. Should be incredible. Well, we're gonna go head up the trail, come along with us, we'll check it out, scope it out. Let's do it. So, land. You know, I'm sure people are wondering, what made you want to pursue geology or why did you choose this career path in part six? Um, I mean, really the reason why I went into geology was because of Zion. Like honestly, coming here growing up, especially in high school and college, um, we'd even skip school, come to Zion sometimes. And I just thought it was so spectacular. I wanted to know how it was formed, you know, it was, just a whole new view of things once you actually know how each formation came to be. So you can see not only the landscape, but you kind of picture it through time, um, kind of picture how it, was, how it was created. So this viewpoint is kind of cool, not only because it gives you a great view of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right, the three patriarchs, but also off to this direction, we've got this huge hill, which is actually an ancient landslide. Right, so it's called the Sentinel Slide because the peak above it is called the Sentinel. But if you can picture, you know, 10,000 to 50,000 years ago, that entire face of the mountain just gave way, right? The, the, I mean, we're talking like a mile worth of rock and sediment. Fell? Completely came down the canyon, caused the landslide so big it actually ricocheted kind of up the other side of the canyon and dammed off the canyon. Holy cow. Right, and so it created a dam that was probably upwards of 1,000 feet high. Right, and then it created a lake behind the dam, which started to fill in with sediment. And that's why Zion has such a flat bottom, right? If you were to go up some of the other canyons like North Fork or Perunuweep, they're just like these V-shaped canyons that don't have any flat area in the bottom. Like the river is just in the bottom of this V-shaped gorge, which is kind of how it is that you're going through the slide. But Zion Canyon, everything up from the Sentinel slide has this flat, beautiful surface because it's a lake bottom. So instead of it being a V, it's basically just a straight line. And like like Yosemite, it's almost like a glacial valley. Oh, really? Because like it was filled deep. in with a lake. I mean, so, so can you picture like looking up the canyon here and having a lake that's like 500 feet deep? That would be crazy. Right, so it dammed up the canyon for thousands of years until it finally broke through the dam. Oh. And then now the river is actually eroding through the old sentinel slide, right? The old dam. When I heard sentinel slide, I pictured Star Wars. Did anybody else? Isn't there sentinels in Star Wars? What? What is the who has sentinels? It's sentinel. Did nobody else picture Star Wars? I when he was saying Sentinel slide, I was picturing like pew, 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 pew. what the heck is this? The Sentinels makes me think of the Matrix. There you go. Yeah, I think it's the Matrix. Now we are crossing the road to get to Lance. Your backpack the doesn't. Work. We're going to go see the Patriarchs, and this is the road you have to cross. How long of a hike up is it? As long as we want to make it. So, I mean, we hit the river here in like a quarter mile, so it's super short. But from there, you catch the horse trail and you can take it for another quarter mile. And then there's a foot trail that just kind of peters out after maybe another mile and a half. Uh, most people probably wouldn't go more than a mile because it gets kind of difficult after that. 
So this is a kind of a cool spot because we're right on the edge of this sentinel slide that we were talking about earlier. Um, the slide, like I said, is like over a thousand feet deep. Right here, the river's starting to cut its way through it. And we're sitting on top of like 500 feet of lake sediments because when this slide would have happened, it would have dammed up the whole canyon and we would be underwater, right? In Lake Zion, ancient Lake Zion, which now no longer exists because it's breached the dam and it's starting to make its way through there. But uh, yeah, we're gonna head up to Court of the Patriarchs, which is a really cool canyon that nobody really knows about. All right, so one of the reasons why I like Zion so much is it really has more variety than probably any other park in the Southwest. Um, you've got a low elevation area that's at 4,000 feet that's all desert, you know, it has a lot of uh, Monument Valley feel, almost like Canyonlands. But then there's a whole nother section of the park up at eight and 9,000 feet that's literally in the mountains, right? I mean, up on the plateau or you're in a pine forest. So you've got all of these different ecosystems going all the way down from the desert to these high plateaus that are, you know, enough, high enough to get 10 feet of snow in the winter. So there's not a lot of places that, that have that kind of variety. So you've got this wide variety of ecosystems all the way from the low deserts to the high mountains where they get tons of snow. Um, and it's that snow that gives us these oases here in the desert. I mean, this creek that we're standing by, it's completely spring fed. It all just comes straight out of the rock, less than a mile upstream from where we are right now. Um, and, and the reason why it exists is because this little canyon, just like most of the little side canyons in Zion, they have these slot canyons up above them, up on the plateau, which we're gonna visit in a minute. And the slot canyons have these tubs that hold water, right? The tubs are formed by swirling rocks and eddies and they kind of tunnel out these big cylindrical tubs that hold water all through the summer and that water seeps down through the sandstone until it hits the layer below this huge Navajo sandstone, this layer that we're looking at, hits a layer that is kind of like a plastic sheet. It won't, it's impermeable, won't let the water get through it. So it all comes out in a spring line. So you've just got tons of springs all over in Zion, uh, all at the same elevation coming out of the rock. It's a really cool place. Lance, tell us where are we? Because man, it is beautiful. Isn't this amazing? Yes. Yeah, so we're here in Upper Pine Creek, right? We're right below the Canyon Overlook Trail. Most people do this trail and they look down into this chasm here and don't really know what is even down there because it's so dark when, you, when you're up on the rim. But this is it. This is the, the beginning of a slot canyon. And you have to get a permit to even go down this canyon. But there's like 12 rappels between here and the end of the canyon and it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And the way these slot canyons, which are iconic, I mean, there's, there's no place in the world that has slot canyons quite as amazing and majestic as Zion's. Uh, particularly this one, which has a cave, right? The whole thing is formed by harder rocks, mostly in this case, limestones that are a little bit harder than the sandstone that we're in. Those limestones get kind of bounced down the river course during flash floods mostly. And they just carve these canyons deeper and deeper. And anytime you get something in the rock that makes it a little harder, you get these spillovers and then they just reinforce themselves. They get, they get bigger and bigger as far as waterfalls because the bigger the waterfall, the more velocity the water has and the rocks have as they go over it. And so then they end up digging deeper holes beneath them. And little by little, they just chisel the canyon into this slit, right? And you can see some of them, right, are these tubs and they're circular. And the reason why they're circular is because you get eddies when this is flowing. You know, this will have five, 10, maybe even 15 feet of water in a big flash flood. Yeah. And that's pushing all these huge limestone rocks in it. And they get in these eddies and they get swirling almost like a drill bit. Mm -hmm. And they just drill their way through the rock. So, hey, you see those mountain goats right there? These mountain <laughs> sheep are pretty unique. It's one of the most healthy herds in all of Utah. They take from this herd and end up kind of making populations in other parts of the state. 
because this herd is so isolated, it's a little less likely to get diseases mm. and end up decimating some of the other herds in the state. It's, uh, pretty, it's pretty common to see mountain sheep here right. in Ukraine. What are, uh, do you know what maybe their favorite food is? I think that mostly they're just feeding on these bushes and the grasses. Let's go Honestly, see the goats. We pet, might be able to pet, pet the goats. goats okay, let's go see those goats. Maybe they have baby goats and a mama goat and a daddy goat. Here, you can you see the whole thing? We found the mountain goats. We found the mountain goats. Obviously, they're too far to touch, but let's go see how close we can get. So right now, me and Lance are gonna see how far down this cliff we can get to actually see this billy goat up close. Is that what you say, mountain goat, billy goat? Yeah, mountain sheep. Mm -hmm. Not too close, but they used to be respectfully close. Yeah, there was a family, now there's one. Let's just hope we don't end up going off the cliff. But, <laughs> wish us luck, we'll see you guys in a minute. We caught up with the goat. Nice. We've been here for five, couple minutes. couple minutes. It sounds like it's pretty comfortable with us. It's just eating, so we're gonna let it do its thing while we go do our thing. But, isn't that awesome. pretty? We're like, we're right on the trail. Yeah, we're five feet away from it. We made it to Canyon Overlook. Woohoo! That'd be kind of crazy to repel this, honestly. All right, so we're here at Canyon Overlook. Um, trying to enjoy the sunset. There's a whole lot of really cool geology that makes this overlook here what it is. Um, the rock is really neat here because you can see the contrast between this red rock that we're standing on and that all the lower cliffs are composed of and then the upper cliffs that you can see are all kind of a lighter color. Um, they bleed even to almost white in certain lights. But it's crazy because it's all the exact same rock, right? It's all part of the same geologic unit called the Navajo Sandstone. And what makes it really unique, besides the fact that it's spectacularly beautiful and that pretty much everywhere that are outcrops, uh, you have like a national park or a national monument. I mean, there's five to seven national parks and national monuments just in this area that all have this Navajo sandstone being the star. But the thing that makes it different uh, as far as this lower and the upper section is that the upper section has had the cement and the coloring, which is a mineral called hematite. So a little bit of illite and hematite, these two minerals that are basically like an iron-based mineral that rusts, right? So where they oxidize or rust, they turn red, they can turn brown, uh, all the colors that you can think of if you look in an old car, like in your, in your yard for a couple of years and it just really started to rust, you'd have all these, you know, even greens. So the rock will have all those colors because of the hematite that's in the rock and, and its oxidation state. But the upper parts of the rock, right? The, the white sections, that's where some of that iron has been leached out of the rock. And so, you know, now it doesn't have that coloring in it, even though it's the exact same unit. And it was all formed the same way, uh, in a really cool way. It was all huge sand dune, right? So if you can picture this place 200 million years ago, it'd be basically like the Sahara Desert, right? You'd have these massive 2,000 foot thick sand dunes as far as the eye could see. I mean, hundreds of square miles of massive sand dunes. And that's all there would have been. You know, maybe a little bit of, uh, oases or wadis here and there, but for the most part just blowing sand, right? And it stayed like that for a long time until sea level rose, because it was near sea level. Sea level rose up, covered all those sand dunes with the sea, and then all that ocean water sepped into the sand. Just like if you, if you picture a jar that's full of marbles, you know, or even just sand, pour water in it, that water's gonna go in between all the pore spaces, right? Well, the seawater that covered this sand dune was chock full of limestone right? Carbonate. So all of that lime that was in the water also sept in between the little sand grains and then it kind of precipitates out. It kind of comes out of solution and goes in between each of those grains of sands and cements it together. So, so it's kind of cool. Basically all we have is a huge ancient sand dune that's been cemented together with ocean water, right? And the way that that ocean water flowed through the sand when it was doing the cementing is really what caused all of the variations that you see 
in the rock here. You know, all these little lines and cross beds, all these little red layers. That all has to do with differences in the cementation when that seawater, you know, seeping into the sand and cementing it all together, you know, combined with maybe little occasional rivers within the sand dunes here and there, or maybe a little interdunal wadi, you know, little oases here and there that, that you can even find dinosaur footprints in occasionally. But it's a petrified sand dune. So, I mean, really, how cool is that to have this ancient 200 million year old petrified sand dune that we get to enjoy now as it's eroding away? Oh, dear Lance, why is there a cave in the middle of this mountain? That's pretty cool, right? There's, no, that's There's insane. another one right over there. Right, those, those are the windows to the tunnel that we just drove through, right? And the Zion Tunnel. We were in there? We were fully in there. We were we? inside of the rocks. That's exactly what we drove through. Does that make us dinosaurs? I basically, or petrified or something. I mean, the Zion Canyon Tunnel is, is pretty cool. Highlight of the park, right? Stop, hawk your horn. It's like every little kid's dream come oh, true. Oh, you get a good, Here's nice, meaty car. <clears throat> That's right. How long is Full the mile. It's like Full mile. one mile long. A mile inside of the rocks. Yeah. And the craziest part is, how was it built? So, I mean, it's an old tunnel, right? It's 100 years old now, almost. Built in the 1930s as part of the Great Depression, right? So during the Great Depression, they had the CCC come into Zion and they built a bunch of the trails. They built the whole East Canyon Highway. They built the tunnel. And they're using this old school technology, right? Where they come in through all of these holes right at the base. They go in, they go up with dynamite. They're just blasting their way through the rock. And then they came out from all five of the windows and so this is the crazy part. I mean, can you imagine you're in the 1930s? It's not like they have GPS or anything that can work in the rock even now, but they're, they're trying to find their way and meet each other from each of the holes that they're drinking, and, and they did it. It's like they, they totally met each other instead of missing. All right, guys, it's getting a bit cold. We're ready to go back down. Thank you guys so much for obviously hanging out with us on this beautiful, amazing day. And thank you to Lance. Come on in, Lance. Thanks, Lance, for being our special guest, Dude, giving awesome. us some information about where we're at. You know, like, we appreciate having you. Awesome, this, is, this is Zion Made Easy, and uh, do 